Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics, and this is the Grace Optics M1 Red Dot Sight. From the outside, the M1 seems to be a maybe an innovation in the design features, if you will, of Red Dot Sights, specifically for handgun use, and the fact that, and quoting Grace Optics here, it has a topless design, meaning there is no top shroud. There's two protruding, um, I guess, posts, if you will, that rise above the level of glass, but the actual lens itself is topless. It's a convertible, it's a T-top, it's uh, something like that. It does have a black coating on the top, which I imagine they added so you didn't have light diffusion coming down through the glass itself, which could complicate your sight picture, but we'll get to that. It's a 3 ohm away sight. It takes a 1632 battery, and it has elevation and windage adjustments. Now, you'll notice that's kind of a, like, okay, of course it does. Um, but I don't know what the adjustments are because the literature that comes with the optic doesn't state what each little click gives you. So half M away, quarter M away, MRAD, whatever. It could be parsecs, planks, whatever. Um, but that doesn't matter because it doesn't actually click. So you kind of just got to wiggle it a little bit, turn it. And when I read through the literature, it just tells me that the windage and elevation adjust the position of the dot. Uh, to right or up those traditionals, but I don't know if that's direction of impact or if it's just direction of dot uh, I wasn't really sure on that. So zeroing it was you know, more or less straightforward I guess, but I, there was some guesswork involved I mounted it on my sig 320 because it has a Romeo 1 footprint, which the literature doesn't mention at all uh, You can go online and find information that says hey, this is what the footprint is but in the actual Packaging that you get it doesn't actually say it comes with a Picatinny mount that you can put on there um but it doesn't say what the footprint is. No big deal, because uh, I've got you know a couple different guns that I could work with, and I went online and found out, hey, it's a Romeo 1 footprint. So I'll go ahead and mount it on the SIG, because that's Romeo 1 native. I uh, went ahead and put it on there, and it, luckily it does have torque recommendations in the packaging. So it wasn't too difficult to torque correctly, but we'll get to that too. If you're not familiar with my review process, it's generally 2,000 rounds. Now I evaluate pretty much every red dot sight that comes along, most of the time I film the initial 2,000 rounds of my evaluations, but I take optics until failure uh, multiple times, multiple versions. So if I have an optic that doesn't make it for the, you know, through X amount of rounds, I'll purchase another one, put it back through the testing process. Uh, for video purposes, I do add a 500 round burn down, but I'm gonna drop test the optic every 500 rounds regardless of whether I'm filming it or not, because most of the time I'm doing this for personal data, for professional data, not for YouTube. But I had enough questions about this optic, and some of the questions gave me pause because they were coming from people who might trust their lives literally to this optic that I figured I should go ahead and put it through my evaluation process. And that's exactly what I did. One change I have made for video purposes, I've mentioned this past couple videos, is I have moved the burn down. The reason I have done that is because I used to zero the optic and immediately do a 500 round burn down and then the first drop test. If the optic broke on that first drop test, it would only give me those 500 rounds shooting in the same distance uh, and accuracy standards during the burn down to give me a feel for the optic. So I wanted to move that to the second 500 round block of rounds. So for the first 500 rounds, I could get a feel for the optic using it in various conditions, lighting conditions, distances, weather if weather was available, uh, drawn from concealment, drawn from duty holster, basically everything I'm gonna do in general practice anyway. So for my first 500 rounds with the Grace M1, uh, I just went about my normal practice. I did have some fragility concerns with the Grace M1 because of its topless design. Also, uh, I was a little confused, and I'll be honest. They say that the topless design helps you have an unobstructed sight picture. And I, I, was, I actually was like, you know what, I could, I could be wrong. Maybe I've just been shooting red dot pistols wrong this whole time, and that little top shroud that adds uh, rigidity and protection to my lens, it's on every other single optic that's out there. Maybe, maybe that's not supposed to be there. And I thought, okay, well, let me go ahead and put it on the timer and put it through, put it through its paces and see what kind of results I see. I don't see a measurable increase in performance and I don't notice a different acquisition of the dot because of the topless design. That doesn't mean it can't help somebody, but it's certainly not something that's gonna be useful for me or something I really even notice, except 
when I'm using the optic in direct sunlight. When I use the optic in direct sunlight, I definitely notice the topless design because it diffuses my LED panel and the lens itself to where I have a scatter, a constellation map, if you will, and I've got to pick out my 3M away dot from that hot mess. Is that a design failure? I, I can't say. I think it's conditional and it's situational based on the lighting condition, and it's certainly not unique to this optic. I have seen it from other optics. However, I don't think the topless design is making its case. Also, because the window comparatively is kind of smaller, um, graduated because of the shape, than some of the other full-size RDS, pistol RDS, pistol native RDSs that are out there. So I, I guess I just don't understand other than from a marketing position or from a let's be different position, why someone thought that this was substantially better than what else was already out there. Uh, I think they could have increased the durability of the optics significantly by adding even a thin um, additional level of support. And the reason I bring that up is because just based on the design and my admittedly rudimentary understanding of force loading, shock loading, and geometry, if something starts like this and you apply downward force like that, you may end up doing this. Uh, and the lens is in there. So if I were to drop it and it hit just right and force was applied and, and, and kind of even allowed to flex on those two supporting uh, lens posts, Theoretically, I could loosen the adhesive that holds the lens in place, but we'll get to that. Battery life is probably great. It's powered by a 1632, uh, the notch filter on the lens is very unnoticeable. Uh, if you're not familiar, they usually that bluish tint that you see on some optics, that's there to prevent certain transmissions of light spectrum. Um, to maximize battery life. So if, it, if it, it limits certain wavelengths, if you will, of light transmitting through the lens, it allows the dot to be set lower at a lower setting so you can see it, which prolongs overall battery life. The Grayson one doesn't seem to really have a very noticeable notch filter, so the clarity is not bad unless you're aiming in direct sunlight like the sun's directly overhead or behind your target. They have a four hour auto shut off. Now that's not like shake awake or anything. After four hours, the optic just turns off and you have to manually turn it back on. Now this is a problem for me. Um, it's a little, uh, uh, just instructions and information that comes with the Grace M1, which is kind of like a poster, I guess. That's cool. And I quote, the low profile M1 is the ideal optic solution for concealed carry and law enforcement use on handguns and AR style rifles along with a variety of other applications. Okay, um, now I, I was a cop once and I never had a shift that was just three hours and 59 minutes. Uh, concealed carry, uh, I could carry my gun for 16 hours and as a cop I'd work eight, 10 or 12 hour shifts so I guess I'm curious as to why you would have an auto off to conserve battery life or whatever. And then I have to manually turn it back on. So already it's a non-starter both for concealed carry and for law enforcement just based on that feature. I can't believe that the ad copy guy was allowed to write that and it made it through and into the box because if someone is a little bit less informed, they might believe like, oh, okay, cool. I'll go ahead and carry this on duty or I'll carry this for concealed carry or I'll use it for home defense and set it on the nightstand at night. Set your alarm for three hours and 59 minutes, wake up, turn the optic back on, go back to sleep. That's retarded. And I'm using the correct use of that word. It is a failure in thinking and a failure in design. Now, Grace could get some feedback from people like myself and, and users like that and be like, hey, can you maybe remove that feature or add a shake awake feature, programming, something like that? Um, and maybe that would improve the overall performance of the optic as far as it being on when you need it. Uh, but to say it's for law enforcement and concealed carry and have a four hour auto off, that right there makes me, well, I have a question for Grace Optics. Why? Now I mentioned the torque specs and um, I didn't forget. So, and again, I quote, install on the optic modified slide. Use the provided T10 Torx L key and the 648 Torx head screws to secure the housing to the slide. Make sure the connection is tightly secure with 12 inch pounds turning the screws in a clockwise direction. So 12 inch pounds of torque, which is exactly what I applied with my torque wrench and started 
my, my initial 500 rounds. Part of that 500 rounds was one-handed manipulations using the optic slide, or I'm sorry, the optic itself to manipulate the slide, which is something we want to know how to do optic handgun or not in the event that our other hand is occupied or injured. So we want to be able to work the slide in the event of a malfunction, reloading, anything like that. So that's what I did. I worked it off of a piece of plywood, plywood barricade, uh, and after 10 dummy rounds, I noticed that the dot was hanging out in the left side of the window. And I'm thinking, wow, did I cause some kind of internal damage? No, the screws had just loosened up. So I tightened them back down, zeroed the gun again, uh, and then set out throughout the, the you know the remainder of the rounds. I put rounds back in, went down range, and started doing from concealment. Then I switched over to a duty holster, uh, started working from that, and then I did some more one-hand manipulations, and it happened again, only this time it was on the right side of the window. So it's inconsistent. 12 inches, 12 inch pounds is not sufficient torque, but that's what they recommend. Of course, they also said the optic was ideal for concealed carry and law enforcement use, so I'm starting to question if they know what they're talking about. Now, you're probably, you're probably thinking, man, man, you're being really critical. Uh, yeah, I am, because this optic is recommended for concealed carry and law enforcement purposes. If that, if that sentence wasn't in the literature, I probably wouldn't be as critical of the optic. But if you're going to recommend an optic for someone to literally, uh, and this is no hyperbole at all, because it's in the literature, uh, they say, hey, you should, your life can depend on this optic. Uh, no, it can't. And there's a couple of reasons for that. 500 rounds complete, we got to our first drop test. At first, I was like, hey man, it survived the first drop test. And I was pleasantly surprised, because I appreciate when I'm wrong. Um, I thought it would immediately break, and it didn't, but it did. Um, so yeah, the lens didn't break, but my, my initial hypothesis that applying pressure to this V design would allow it to momentarily spread and potentially weaken the epoxy that holds the lens in place, um, that came true. So I was a little Nostradamus on that, uh, but I've been testing optics for some time now and I can generally look at an optic at this point and see areas that are probably gonna lead to a failure or potential failure or be the most likely cause of a failure. And the design of the Grace is definitely that. Now you may be saying to yourself, well, I'm not gonna drop my gun. Okay, cool. Uh, I appreciate your ability to predict the future. However, the drop test is not for just because I think people are going to drop their gun from a shoulder height, although guns fall off tailgates and tables and stuff like that inadvertently. Uh, it's like walking a tightrope. You walk it long enough, you're going to fall off. So if you set your gun on high things and gravity is a constant, eventually your gun's going to take a tumble. And it may not be much of a tumble, maybe three or four feet or onto a pillow or something like that. Uh, but we want something that can handle that. And my goalpost is shoulder height drop tests. Uh, so if you want to make excuses for this optic, this is not the place to do it. The main reason for the drop test is to have a, have a more or less consistent amount of pressure, energy, impact, velocity, whatever you want to call it, um, for the optic testing to simulate the optic taking a hard hit. We already showed that the, the recommended torque specs allowed the optics to come loose during one-handed manipulation. No big deal. You could just tighten it down more, re-zero it, and know like, hey, maybe I'll send these guys a, a fun email and say, hey, maybe 12 isn't enough. Maybe you should recommend a little bit more. But uh, I already hear back from my students, uh, both concealed carry students in my open classes and my LE instructors from my Red Dot instructor course and my non-LE instructors from my Red Dot instructor course who say like, hey, I'm hearing back from guys and here's some situation. I even put out a, like, hey, if you guys have an optic fail, uh, have them complete this cool little PDF form, send it back to me so I can keep track of that. Um, the most common failures I see are optics getting crushed in the holster during some kind of ground fighting or you take an impact against a barrier, the side of a car, something like that during a physical altercation. Uh, I don't think this optic would do well in that situation either, but I have no way to know because it broke on the first drop test. I think for me this really comes down to the difference in definitions between the word inexpensive and the word cheap. Inexpensive, good, high quality red dot sites exist, but also cheap red dot sites exist. There's no quality in cheap, but there can be quality in inexpensive. This is a cheap optic. This is not an optic I would mount on an airsoft pistol or on a Nerf gun or really anything at all because for what you pay for it, I can get a marginally better optic or maybe even a quite better optic if I buy something secondhand than what's being offered here. I think their selling point is it's different, but one of the things I try to tell people is reliability is boring. And the reason, the whole reason for that statement is 
Things that are reliable tend to be reliable because they follow a consistent set of guidelines that lead to reliability. So you'll see five or six different brands have a very similar product, and that's because reliability is boring. There's a certain amount of features that are going to work and a certain amount of design ideas that are going to work, and anything that departs from that probably has already been attempted and found to not provide the same degree of quality or performance. This optic sets itself apart by being a complete piece of shit. Now, if they reprint <laughs> that handy little uh, information packet directions and poster that they provide with the Grayson one in the box and they omit that line about it being the ideal optic, my emphasis added, they didn't add that, they didn't put it in italics or underline it or anything. If they omit that sentence about being the ideal optic for concealed carry in law enforcement, I would more than willing to be able to revise this video and say, uh, yeah, it's an optic, it exists, it's fragile, I wouldn't recommend it. But because they put that sentence in there, I am being way more critical. So I want to make sure that there's no confusion whatsoever. Do not buy this optic, especially if you're going to use it for concealed carry or law enforcement use. But I think I'll go a little further than that and just say, don't buy this optic. On a scale of the worst red dot sites ever that I have ever encountered, um, this might be number one um, for a number of reasons which I've already covered. Um, there are optics made by BB gun companies that I would probably choose over this because at least they were honest in the fact they didn't say, hey, we're not recommending this for concealed carrier duty use, but it's pretty durable. <sighs> Don't buy it. I'm Eric Count Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.